Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again! So in 2010, I reviewed a very silly comic crossing over the X-Men and Star Trek the original series. Also, my original intention in that episode was to review the Twilight manga. Should probably do that at some point. Anyway, point is, the comic is not very good. Some amusing moments, but the art styles clashed, the plot was bizarre, and the narrative wasn't well developed. Three years later, I ended up reviewing the sequel comic, wherein the crew of the Enterprise D found themselves flung back in time to the era of the X-Men in an equally bizarre story that, while not terrible, and even very well paced, is incredibly convoluted and seemed to exist mostly to shove in a bunch of fan service to the two franchises. But the thing that's even weirder about it is that the story was not intended to end there. The comic ended with a bright light flashing over the X-Men and declaring that it would be continued. And the patron decided it was time to finally cover that continuation. Complete the trilogy, as it were. This leads us to an interesting dilemma there, because this isn't a comic, it's a novel. The closest I've gotten to reviewing a novel was years ago, when I reviewed the Hobbit comic adaptation, and I had to read the book for the first time ever to compare it with the adaptation. At first I thought I would bring in an expert on reviewing books, that being, of course, Dominic Noble. But then I decided that if I'm going to be doing a review like this, I need to make it uniquely my own, in my own style, and thus I must figure this out without Dom's help. Wow, what a weird waste of a cameo. So much like the Minister of Chance Patreon-sponsored review from years ago, this is a medium without any visuals I can call on for presentation. Fortunately, what makes this work better than, say, just any old novel review, is that we have two different franchises to call upon that have tons and tons of artwork to them already in comic form. So when appropriate, I'll be using a lot of comic still frames to represent what's happening in the book. Probably TV stills, too. Which means I'll save time by not needing to collect comic panels for the review, and I don't have to edit them moving! And this episode is still late, because nothing I ever do will get us back on schedule ever again! I just made myself sad! But hey, perhaps this review will open up opportunities for others to patron book reviews down the line that I'll probably say no to because they don't feature starships or Marvel characters. But for now, let's dig into Star Trek The Next Generation slash X-Men Planet X and see how I handle a novel review for the first time. sure if I should be talking about the cover with this. I mean, book covers do contribute to people wanting to buy something, but in this case, I feel like people would buy it for the concept alone. It's not that great a cover either, just a weird collage of X-Men and Star Trek characters, including Xavier the Great and Powerful here. Now I'm radioactive! That's probably good for my mutant powers, my X-Men! There are 34 chapters, plus a prologue and epilogue, and we'll be going through them all. The prologue begins on an unnamed alien world, where a boy named Arid is undergoing a ritual people in his culture do when they become adults. I will be a new person, Arid Savar told his friends, savoring the warmth of the afternoon sun on his face. I will be a person this world has never seen before. I will be Peter Stormare. The ritual involves taking a journey without food or water on a sacred path to a certain hill of rocks, sitting on them, and then trying to question himself and the universe on who he is, his purpose, etc. If this was a live-action Star Trek thing, this would probably be filmed at Vasquez Rocks. 
So he sat there, alone under the terrible and unexpected brightness of the stars, and sang psalms to the inclinations of his spirit. All he had to do was sing the song they had said, and he would find the elements that made him unique. The elements that finally and irrevocably made him Arid Savar. Yo, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Eventually, after contemplating how one person he cared about was not there with him in the lead-up to this ritual, he finally felt a change and confidence come over himself, and he believed the ritual was complete. Unfortunately, on the climb back down, he slipped and fell down the rocks until hitting his head. Still, he seemed okay for a while despite the head injury. Until veins started popping up all over his body, his limbs went weak, and he started shooting white energy beams out of not only his fingers, but other parts of his body. Puberty can be tough on this planet. The energy eventually calmed down, but purple veins on his bronze-colored skin remained, and that's our prologue. We properly start on Starbase 88, where the X-Men, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, Shadowcat, Archangel, Colossus, Banshee, and Storm reappear inside of a cargo bay and are found by the station's security. When they recognize the Starfleet uniforms, they ask to talk to Captain Picard. Nothing solves problems in time travel quite as much as name-dropping. Back on the alien world in the prologue, now identified as Zaldia, the Chancellor of the World Government has been getting reports of people suddenly developing strange and dangerous powers. People turning invisible, super speed, shooting out energy or casting illusions, etc. The only consistent pattern is people who recently turned the age of 22, and while none of the people's powers have been used deliberately to harm people, they have caused some fatalities by accident. Seeing no other option, the Chancellor, named Praetus Amon, orders all of those who have developed powers to be rounded up and brought to an old fortress until they can figure out what the hell's going on. Over to our other heroes, we learn that the book takes place around the middle of Season 6 of Deep Space Nine, with Worf returning to the Enterprise to help coordinate a conference on the ship with the Klingons. There's a surprise party for his return that, in a neat bit of character development, he actually is happy about because he was worried about his friends not really giving a crap about his return. Hopefully it'll turn out better than his last surprise party, which resulted in him shifting from one pair parallel universe to another because of multimodal reflection sorting. Or, as we see in this cool shot, Worf, no way home. The Enterprise is informed of the X-Men's arrival, and since Starbase 88 is on their way to their destination anyway, they agree to come pick them up and help figure out how to get them back to their own universe. While we see Arid Savar, er, uh, not, not see, uh, we read? We imagine? What's the terminology here when I'm describing text with no pictures? Whatever, Arid Savar is brought to the fortress, where we learn that they're trying to keep the whole people spontaneously developing powers thing under wraps, much to the frustration of our prologue character. Interestingly, though, on board the Enterprise, we're told of a Lieutenant Savar who has a very similar description to Arid manning the tactical station. Could be the stuff on Zaldi as a flashback, or this is Savar's brother or father or something. If Star Trek runs on anything, it's extreme coincidences. Family members popping up out of nowhere, the number 47 appearing all the time, all major plot points somehow revolving around Michael Burnham, we really should just rename the franchise a What a Coinky Dink! At the fortress, we learn that so far, there are about 30 of the people with powers being held there. Some of them, like Arid, have their abilities activated by sunlight, but the more important detail is a new arrival named Rahatan. He suggests that maybe they should be treated a little better by the guards, rather than stunned whenever they get upset over being imprisoned against their will, and that they can use their powers as weapons to fight back. At Starbase 88, Wolverine apparently got into a little altercation with people and had to be shoved in the brig. Typical Wolverine behavior, but weirder is that Archangel has apparently taken to flying through the corridors, which seems more than a little weird. Not just because I doubt the corridors are big enough for his fully extended wings. I mean, maybe if this was a modern Trek show, where we apparently make starship corridors big enough to drive two cars side by side, but this is supposed to be TNG. But also because they imply that it's just weird for him to not be flying all the time in a free and open environment. But like, he's had to just walk around the mansion before, right? Anyway, once they're brought to the Enterprise, Captain Picard explains the difficulty they have in getting the X-Men home. The method used for time travel were called time hooks and the X-Men were wearing them when they teleported into the Trek universe, but those weren't with them when they showed up. The ones the Enterprise crew had when they returned from the previous crossover were shipped to Starfleet for study, then supposed to be shipped back to the Enterprise, because why leave them in the hands of dedicated researchers when you could just give them to the flagship, who will promptly toss them in a junk drawer and forget about them? 
But then the Dominion War broke out and the time hooks were misplaced. As a result, they need to track them down. Still, with as weird as Trek has been, there are other methods to try to send them back, so they should be able to figure out some way of making it all work. They also make sure to put in some references to their respective histories, mostly Picard, in a way that's... Honestly, not unlike a fanfic dropping continuity details and implying some sexual tension between Picard and Storm. No doubt you were surprised to hear from us. I was, the captain agreed. Though to be honest, I often found myself thinking about you. I wanted to show you the captain's log, as it were. Back on Zaldia, tensions are starting to escalate at the fortress, to the point where Rahatan utilizes his own power, Geomancy, to start attacking guards and some others try to make an escape. All fail and are stunned, but it's clear that things are going to start boiling over soon. On the Enterprise, Jordy takes the opportunity to test Nightcrawler's teleportation powers, wondering if they work like the transporter. The transporter in Star Trek converts matter to energy, transmits it via a guiding beam, and rematerializes the energy as matter elsewhere. Nightcrawler's teleportation has him briefly pop through another dimension before re-emerging back in the universe. Geordi's scans reveal that Nightcrawler may actually be passing through subspace when he does this. Subspace being a smaller dimension that Trek utilizes for a number of things. It's by ducking into subspace that the Enterprise is able to travel at faster than light speeds. Geordi, I'm gonna want to see your engineering certification again because that is not how the Enterprise travels at faster than light speeds. Star Trek utilizes a warp drive, and put in layman's terms, the space-time continuum is basically compressed or warped so that the actual distance you're traveling isn't that far, with a field around the ship to protect it from the effects of that and helping propel it in the direction you want to go. Now, a subspace field is part of that, but it's not ducking into subspace. Despite what Trek 09 and modern Trek series would have you believe with their visuals of it, they're not traveling through hyperspace here like in Star Wars. They're still in the universe. Now, some of you will probably point out, why does this even matter? It's all made up techno babble anyway. And you would be correct for the most part. This is a nitpick and the dramatic elements are more important. However, some things to remember. One, I am a dork. Two, the basis of how technology in Star Trek works is also relevant as plot points to several episodes and stories across the franchise. Making it consistent and sticking with the established parameters set forth in the universe is important for dramatic purposes and keeps the audience clued in on how things work, especially when you decide to play with those elements for new storytelling. See Stargate, for instance, on the number of times they were able to mine new story opportunities based on how the Stargate itself works, or making the plot more dramatic or mysterious by making things not work the way they're supposed to. Three, if this stuff doesn't matter at all, why bother even trying to talk about it or how it works? It might as well be the sci-fi equivalent of, it's magic, I don't have to explain it. And I personally think that's lazy. Anyway, point is, Jordy and Nightcrawler theorize that he could use his ability to teleport much larger distances than normal, as long as he had some method of strong propulsion. On Zaldia, the transformed, as they're called, start planning an escape, figuring that what's happening to them is BS, and by working together, they can use their powers to go home. While Wolf and Wolverine get to bond over Worf's holodeck calisthenics program, aka they get to beat stuff up together, the prison riot goes off without a hitch, knocking out but not killing any of the guards. The transformed tie up the guards and put them in cells, though leave behind one of their former comrades, a criminally insane man named Malik who keeps repeating his own name over and over. And apparently he can set things on fire by looking at them. A power that would definitely come in handy for me anytime I remember that Marvel exists. Once freed, there's a debate about what to do next. Rahatan thinks they should go to the neighboring city and take it over. Another person says that plan is insane since gathering in one place just means the government will come back and take them again. She instead suggests they split up and try to blend into society, even offering those who are having a more difficult time with that come with her and she'll use her illusion powers to help them until they think of something else. She refuses to follow Rahatan further because she won't exchange one form of tyranny for another. And as she's walking away, Rahatan has the Earth swallow her up and then claim she was a cancer who would have destroyed them all. See, this is why Formal debates are so pointless, someone always ends up getting murdered.
On board the Enterprise, we get confirmation that Lieutenant Savar is Arid's brother, called it, and learn that the two are estranged from each other because of Savar's decision to leave Zaldia and join Starfleet, which Arid disapproves of, preferring a more traditional life. The Transformed make their way to the nearby city and take over some abandoned buildings, spreading out a bit among them while they rest and plan their next moves. The speedster Korba even deciding to get closer to Arid and spend the night with him. Back on the Enterprise, more characters talking to each other about their continuity like Archangel and Troy talking about coming from lives of privilege, Data reciting his origins to Banshee, but the more amusing thing is Chapter 13. It's only five pages long, more about Guinan lamenting the loss of the old tent forward lounge on the Enterprise-D, and then Wolverine coming in, not being impressed by some of the stronger drinks of the bar, so Guinan challenges him to try a warrior's drink. Worf's preferred beverage of choice... Prune juice. And the best part is that Wolverine has completely good humor about it. Turns out if you just let him stab things for a while, it loosens him up. Or at least the prune juice will in a couple hours. Storm offers a bit more of an explanation for Archangel's goofy flying around everywhere beyond just needing to feel free. That he's testing the limits of people's tolerance. Basically seeing just how far the pie-in-the-sky utopia of the Federation really is for people different like him. Because equality and tolerance are measured by how much of a jackass you are to people. Zaldia decides to send out a call for help from the Federation to try to help resolve the situation with the Transformed. Naturally, the Enterprise is the closest ship in range, so they head off to deal with the emergency. It seems like they don't mention what the issue is, and that's probably for the best on their part. While I'm no big fan of the implementation of the Prime Directive during the TNG era of Trek, this is a big ol' example of it, an internal conflict for these people that the Federation wouldn't normally get involved in. But it turns out they did actually tell them what's happening, so... I don't know how the Prime Directive doesn't stop this. Anyway, that being said, it turns out to have been a good call anyway, because a mysterious ship suddenly appears, having been hidden by Zaldia's moon, and it destroys their interstellar communication satellites and not responding to hails. Unless them shooting the satellites was the response. I mean, it could be that these things were beaming spam messages to the aliens. Whoever the aliens are, they quickly locate some of the transformed and kidnap a few of them, the others making a hasty retreat from the abandoned buildings. The situation with the transformed doesn't stay a secret for long, Savar being told first First, and the X-Men soon learning afterwards. Realizing that this is so similar to the emergence of mutants in their universe, they offer to help with matters, though Picard insists that they let him handle things first and call upon them when needed. But in the meantime, more interesting things happen. They arrive in orbit and find the aliens, a race called the Dracon, spelled with two A's and an apostrophe. Troy is able to empathically sense a lot from them before they even start talking, that they are belligerent, have no regard for life outside their own, that they only crave power, and that they're on Zaldia specifically for a purpose and not just conquest. Storm is impressed by how much she's able to pick up from such a distance. Even Professor Xavier would need equipment to do that. It's also a bit of a continuity issue, because if Troy's empathic powers were that spot on, she might not have had such a bad reputation as a character. Admittedly, Troy's empathic powers being able to read things at a long distance has always been kind of iffy or unclear on the show, but the sheer amount of specificity she gets seems a bit more than she'd normally be able to pull off. The leader of the Dracon, High Implementer Isajo, orders the Enterprise to leave, and Picard naturally tells him to piss off. Although in a lot more classy and diplomatic way than I would, because he's John Luke Picard, and I'm a snarky idiot on YouTube. The Dracon ship is built for war, and while the Enterprise is no slouch, they're a bit outgunned. In the ensuing fight, they manage to destroy one of the Dracon's nacelles, but the Enterprise loses its shields, weapons, and warp drive. Thanks to the fact that Nightcrawler's teleportation can bypass shields, they quickly come up with an idea. Have him and Data bamf over to the enemy ship, wreck some stuff, particularly their shields, then start transporting over boarding parties to take them out from the inside out. Secondary shield emitters pop up before more than one team can beam over, though. Naturally, cute references are given to officers Kirby and Ditko on the security team. The weirder is that apparently the Dracon built their ship's corridors big enough for Archangel to fly up and shoot at them. We were discussing uh, air supremacy, Sir Arthur. Since they can't board anyway, Commander Riker is ordered to take an away team down to Zaldia via shuttlecraft. Transporting down to the planet is difficult under normal circumstances due to tech-tech particles in the atmosphere. You know, a nice thing that happens when you're reading a book is your mind wanders to possibilities of the story, and then the author anticipates them. For instance, when Worf's team reached the Dracon's engine room, I started to think, man, their security is garbage. Why wouldn't they gas the intruders or have force fields or something to lock down sections? 
And the book answered that. Indeed, turns out their internal sensors were damaged in the fight, and it's only thanks to Worf's team running from engineering that they're able to set up force fields to try to vent the atmosphere in that section. Fortunately, thanks to Banshee being on the team, the combination of his sonic scream and three phasers is able to take out one of the force field projectors and proceed toward the Dracon transporter room, where Data and Nightcrawler wait for them. They're able to beam back to the Enterprise while Riker's forces touch down on the planet, split up, and work to engage the Dracon trying to kidnap the transformed. Captain's Log, Supplemental. As we race to effect repairs on the Enterprise, I find myself locked in a stalemate with High Implementer Asajo of the Brutal Dracon. I fear the only solution to this problem is a rap battle. I have prepared for this moment my entire life. On the surface, Savar and Shadowcat spot a group of Drakan chasing some transformed and manage to take them down, but the group includes Arid, who angrily proclaims that they don't need help and to leave them alone. Unfortunately, it's even worse for Data and Nightcrawler. The latter gets Crystal formed around his head when he tries to help some, and Data gets zapped by one. Inspired by comments that some of the X-Men made, Dr. Crusher decides to try to use the holodeck to create a simulation of Charles Xavier to help advise on the situation with Zaldia. Made using computer files they obtained during the visit to the Marvel Universe. Oh boy, the last time someone in the Next Generation cast tried to recreate a person on the holodeck, they just ended up wanting to bang her. Eh, Crusher already had a thing for Picard anyway, so it all balances out. I'm only half joking. She does comment to herself that Xavier somewhat resembles Picard. This was before the X-Men movies came out, and even back then there were rumblings about getting Patrick Stewart to play the role. I remember it being the dream fan casting, and thank God that's how it ended up playing out. Anyway, after explaining everything to Hollow Xavier, he agrees to do what he can. Data awakens none the worse for wear, and is able to convince the Transformed that he and Nightcrawler aren't their enemies by talking about his own difficulties in being unique, and sometimes shunned for being different. Because if there's anything the Trek has mastered over the X-Men franchise, it's making speeches. In the X-Men's case, they're good at it, but often people get shot in the middle of making one. Just ask Ultimate Cyclops. Oh wait, you can't. He was shot in the middle of making a speech. The Drakan, apparently responsible for creating the Transformed, as Asajo notes, don't want them to fall into the Enterprise's hands for fear of replicating what they did, so they decide if they can't have them, nobody can. He unleashes some kind of powerful explosive missile at the planet aimed at the city they were in. Since the Enterprise's weapons are still down, the only option Picard can think of is to fly a shuttle out and try to destroy it though he'd have to get close enough to blow himself up in the process. Archangel volunteers to come with and try to manually disarm it while in flight, because I guess he can breathe in space during this time? I don't know. Whatever, Picard agrees. Back on the surface, after rescuing some rather ungrateful Zaldian citizens who were more than happy to sell out the Transformed, Colossus and Counselor Troy encountered some city guards whom they thought were shooting at the Transformed, but were in reality trying to shoot at some of the Drakon past them. Okay, but to be fair, they were still allowing for the Transformed to be in the crossfire, so let's not pretend Colossus wasn't still right to snatch the guns from their hands. As Picard and Archangel reach the missile and get to work trying to disarm it while in the atmosphere, Storm and Riker reach Rahatan, who's killed not only a great number of Drakan, but city guards as well. It's clear he's gone mad with power, especially after he kills two gold shirts who are coming up towards him and some of his followers. Storm challenges him, pointing out how he only sees his powers as a way to gain something for himself, rather than using them for good. While Riker deals with Rahatan's entourage with a phaser, Storm manages to deal with Rahatan fairly easily. Flying out of a chasm, he opens under her, using lightning bolts to shatter rocks he throws her way, and then pelting him with hail when he tries to physically rise up and attack her. She finally brings him down with a wind vortex sucking the air out of him, or possibly just making him so dizzy he passes out. The book isn't clear about that. If the latter, then I feel sorry for his poor followers under him that he threw up on. Archangel succeeds in disabling the bomb, and Picard redirects the thing towards some mountains so it won't cause any more harm. I hope someone remembers to pick that thing up again, or else someday it's gonna be a hell of a find on someone's hike. The remaining Transformed either elect to surrender to the authorities or go with the Starfleet crew, but the Drakan attack the shuttles on the way up. The Enterprise puts itself between them and the Drakan ship, but in the process loses transporters to beam them to safety. Troy's shuttle gets destroyed, but at the last second she uses the emergency transporter on it to beam them directly onto the Drakan's bridge. And Asajo gets to meet Wolverine. I'll bet you're the creepy crawler in charge. I mean, you are the biggest, fattest guy around. Is the Drakan higher? based on weight? Also, no need to disparage Creepy Crawler's Wolverine just because Cyclops wouldn't buy you a Creepy Crawler oven. 
What, that reference isn't a stretch? He comes from the 90s. Dude, why don't you have a creepy crawler's machine, man? Huh, good question. Why don't I? A few days later, Chancellor Amon formally apologizes for what he chose to do to the Transformed. In turn, Dr. Crusher has been able to study the Transformed and have figured out a way to reverse their condition. Should they so desire it, and indeed, quite a few were excited about that. Arid is hesitant, and Savar chooses to support his brother regardless of his decision after their own argument about him joining Starfleet. After Wolverine introduces Worf to a holodeck program he made featuring some of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, it's explained in a meeting what was up with the Drakan. It seems they had developed some kind of genome that would enhance themselves with powerful abilities for new conquests, but their own genetics rejected it. They needed to harvest the abilities in another species to take advantage of it, so 30 years ago they spread it like a genetic virus among the Zaldians, resulting in their powers emerging when they did. They had a limited window to take the Transformed before their powers were too strong for them to deal with, and said window has elapsed. And of course, if they were patient enough to wait 30 years for this little scheme, there's certainly no chance they'd ever try it again! We learn that Jordy hasn't been idle these last few days. He discovered what happened to bring the X-Men there. Apparently when Nightcrawler uses his teleportation, he's showered with a kind of particle normally found in subspace. It's harmless, but it somehow reacted to the time hooks. It turns out the misplaced time hooks have been transferred to Starbase 88 and also somehow been exposed to the particles, acting as a kind of rubber band to snap the X-Men right to it. Now that they have the time hooks again and know what happened, they can use them to send the X-Men home. Oh, and Storm and Picard once again hint about a potential romance. To be continued in Star Trek Picard, no doubt. The X-Men make their farewells to the Enterprise crew and find themselves back at the mansion where they had left. And so our novel ends with, of all people, Q and the Watcher observing these events. Q stating that he manipulated things since he has an interest in Zaldia for the future. Dude, you're a powerful alien being. If you wanted to get involved in the world, just do what other aliens do and leave a monolith. Anyway, this novel is pretty good for the most part. I wouldn't say it's great. Prose-wise, it reads fine. A very breezy read that really steps up and gets exciting once the fight scenes start up. That being said, it feels like a lot of the setup with the Transformed doesn't have as much payoff as it should. All this character development for them, Arid in particular, and it doesn't really go anywhere, making him into a somewhat peripheral character in the ending. He doesn't even contribute to taking down Rahatan or anything. Nothing there is bad, it's just anticlimactic after we spent so much time with him and the other Transformed. Unlike the last two crossovers, with this as a novel, it gives the characters a chance to breathe and interact, allowing for fun stuff like Worf and Wolverine bonding over beating stuff up, or Storm and Picard teasing a romance, but also doing some okay stuff with Archangel. However, there are a lot of scenes that exist theoretically for the sake of character development, but more often are just an excuse to read off bits of continuity and lore, particularly on the Star Trek side of the crossover. The X-Men are not minor players, certainly, but we spend a lot of time referencing and talking about past TNG episodes in this versus X-Men stuff. Not that I necessarily wanted more of that, but as I said earlier, it feels very fanficy, caring more about having characters recite their backstories and past adventures instead of just natural character interactions based on their personalities. Still, the book is overall pretty dang good, and a decent conclusion to this bizarre trilogy of crossovers between two franchises that should otherwise have nothing to do with each other. Also, a shame that even though Hollow Xavier and Picard do get to meet, we never have a real interaction between the two. The closest good gag on that level remains T.O.S. McCoy meeting Beast, since both have the same last name. We're taking next week off so Late Night Double Feature can actually have a triple feature, talking about another trilogy. When we return in June, I get to talk about another star-based franchise with a Review of a Stargate SG-1 miniseries.
Standing knee-deep in fallen adversaries, Wolverine retracted his claws and tossed a grin in Troy's direction. Thanks for leaving a few for me, darling. She chuckled wearily. My pleasure. <laughs> it's so nice to see you stab a bunch of people. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!